Welcome. Uh, as many of you know, uh, uh, tonight's event is part of a three-day seminar for newly elected mayors. And uh, it's hosted uh, jointly by the Institute of Politics here at Harvard, as well as the National Conference on Mayors. Uh, we are uh, part of a historical review where since 1975 we've hosted this event. Uh, tonight's moderator uh, will be uh, Christine Russell, who's both an award-winning freelance journalist, and she's written about science and the environment, uh, and is a highly respected uh, member of the Harvard faculty at the Belfer Center. Uh, the subject matter is, as you know, uh, global warming and the role of mayors in the process, in, in, in the government we sometimes think of as principally a division between branches, but it's also a division between layers of government, and particularly at a time period where at the national level there's been a lack of consensus on this subject. Uh, it's incredibly interesting to see leadership being taken uh, at, the, at the city level at this time. Uh, it's my pleasure at this point to, to interview, uh, introduce briefly the Executive Director of the U.S. Uh, Conference on Mayors, uh, Tom Cochran. Uh, Tom has been the Executive Director for uh, several decades and is considered one of the most respected professionals in Washington, D.C. Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Well, it's good to be uh, back at, at the, the Institute of Politics. We come here every two years with new mayors. But as you know, it's an election year this year. And uh, as a bipartisan organization, we're 75 years old, uh, we are about trying to get the presidential candidates to discuss our issues. And so this year we have a 10-point plan, and uh, it has some very serious proposals in it. We're pushing it hard. Tomorrow we go to New Hampshire to talk about arts, and then we're into Iowa and other primary states, trying to get the candidates to talk about our issues. Global warming, the question of climate protection, is sweeping this country, and it all started by a great mayor named I mean, Nichols from Seattle. Today, tonight, we have 700 in, how many cities, Mayor? 39 cities that have signed our climate protection agreement. He started it, and this president of mine took it over, and uh, we are really have a grassroots movement on the whole question of climate protection. We have Mayor Hahnemann here. We recently uh, hosted with the Japanese Association of City Mayors a seminar on this issue. And of course, Mayor Chavez from Albuquerque, who uh, has hosted uh, water summits and uh, is our primary winner of one of our, the largest award we've ever had. So tonight, um, we want you to know that uh, the mayors of the United States are joining with the mayors throughout the world, asking their federal leaders to sign and be involved with a climate protection agreement so that we can save this planet. Thank you. Uh, good evening and welcome. I'm Chris Russell, the moderator. And I'd also like to welcome the new mayors in the audience. They're kind of hidden out there. Uh, as was mentioned, global warming, going green, saving the environment are the buzzwords of the day, and uh, maybe, hopefully, not just of the day, but of the decade and years to come. And tonight, we're going to talk about how the cities are responding to the climate crisis and whether these grassroots efforts can really make a difference, uh, both nationally and internationally, in solving environmental problems. And as has been mentioned, with a virtual stalemate in recent years at the federal level, there's been a lot of activity by cities and states to put some teeth into that old motto of think globally, act locally. And the media has taken note. I've uh, been amazed in the last couple of weeks. There's a story almost every day about a city doing something. Yesterday, Fountain Valley, California, in Orange County, turning sewage water into uh, drinking water, developers in Harding Township, New Jersey, trying to change zoning laws and put in eco-friendly cluster housing, small houses instead of large sprawling houses on big lots, how Chicago is going to turn its alleys into green alleyways, and places like Fort Collins, Colorado, a traditionally green place and green city where voters are confronting challenges, they want to look to alternative fuels, and at the same time, 
They don't want an, a uranium mine in their backyard providing fuel for nuclear power plants. The list goes on, and tonight we are privileged to have four of the leading green mayors uh, to talk about uh, green cities, the efforts to create them. And I'm going to start to my left, uh, Mayor Martin J. Chavez of Albuquerque, New Mexico, an Albuquerque native. He earned a bachelor's degree from the University of New Mexico and a JD degree from Georgetown Law. He served in the New Mexico State Senate for four years, and he's currently serving his third term as mayor of Albuquerque. Uh, he launched the Albuquerque Green Initiative, and they, Albuquerque has dramatically reduced its greenhouse emissions, decreased water use, and converted vehicles to alternative fuels. And as was mentioned, he won the first Climate Protection Award from the US Conference of Mayors. He's also overseen the usual kinds of things that mayors have to do, city cleanup, restoring fiscal discipline, uh, creating new jobs, and reducing crime. I guess there's crime in Albuquerque by 17%. Mostly comes from Seattle. Yeah. Is, uh... <laughs> and uh, the big news is that he recently announced that he's running for the US Senate. Uh, so perhaps he will not be Mayor Chavez much longer. Next to him, we have Mufi Hanuman, mayor of Honolulu, Hawaii. He was raised in Honolulu, but you'll be happy to know that he attended and graduated from Harvard University, elected freshman class president, and was a varsity basketball letterman, as you might have noticed as we walked in. Uh, upon graduation, he was a Fulbright Scholar at Victoria University in New Zealand. He served under four presidents, starting with Carter and, as recently, George W. Bush at Departments of Interior, Labor, and in the White House. He's been on the Honolulu City Council. And in 2005, he became the first mayor of Honolulu of Samoan descent and the second Mormon mayor, winning by a, a razor-thin margin. So he's happy to be here. He's focused on fiscal restraint, city services, but also saving the natural beauty of Oahu, and he's worked to convert city vehicles to alternative fuels. Uh, at the US Conference of Mayors, he's the chair of Tourism, Arts, Parks, Entertainment, and Sports Committee. Sounds like the fun <coughs> committee. Uh, next to him, Greg Nichols, mayor of Seattle, Washington. He's not a native of Seattle, but he did move there at age six, I believe. Attended the University of Washington, Started his career at age 19 as an aide to Seattle City Council member. He went on to serve in the King County Council for 14 years. 2002 became the 51st mayor of Seattle, now serving his second term. And he has earned a national reputation for innovative leadership in transportation, public safety, climate change, and other challenges facing cities today. Uh, he is known as, I guess, maybe Mayor Pothole. He ordered the city's <laughs> Department of Transportation crews to fill reported potholes within 48 hours. Did that happen? We missed one last quarter. <laughs> and he also pushed for a light rail uh, system to serve Seattle. Uh, on February 16, 2005, when the Kyoto Protocol took effect in the 141 countries that ratified it, and of course, we know that the U.S was not one of them, uh, Mayor Nichols challenged mayors across the country to join Seattle in taking local action to reduce global warming. And he hosted 100 mayors earlier in, do, in November at a climate protection summit uh, for 100 mayors from around the country. Finally, we have Douglas Palmer, mayor of Trenton, New Jersey, born and raised in Trenton, uh, in 1990, became Trenton's first African-American mayor, and he's been reelected four times. He's expanded after-school activities for at-risk youth, expanded health care, increased police presence, uh, built a model welfare, re welfare reform initiative. He's also been a leader in cleaning up contaminated industrial areas for redevelopment, a citywide cleanup program, and uh, Trenton's uh, leading municipality in the state uh, for recycling. 
Most importantly, tonight he is the mayor of the United States Conference of Mayors, and he's made pr climate protection one of his uh, major priorities or his major priority. This might be a good moment to remind anybody else with a cell phone to <laughs> turn it off if you can. Um, I'd like to start by kind of going around the country, uh, maybe starting in Albuquerque. Uh, Mayor Chavez, in 2007, your city was ranked the greenest city in America, uh, beating out 90 other cities. So how did Albuquerque become so green? What are the ways to go Greg green? Greg Nichols wants to know how that happened, too. Right, right. <laughs> that was really all that's important. As long as we beat Seattle, it's something. Uh, no, uh, very simply, and I don't think what the recognition was, and it was the best city addressing climate change, was that every one of our programs is superior to any others. I think you go to any number of cities, particularly those represented here, uh, and, 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 a, and a number of others, uh, and you'll find better specific programs in different categories. I think the recognition was more that we ramped up more quickly uh, from where we were once we recognized the problem and then set about uh, uh, you know, finding solutions to it. Uh, very simply, uh, we worked with the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, established baselines on our carbon footprint, uh, and found out you know, what are our sources of emission, and then developed a strategy in each category uh, for addressing it. So we know that probably the largest contributor are buildings, the uh, uh, construction and operation of buildings in terms of carbon emissions, so uh, hence the Green Building Code. We looked at fleet, convert fleet, uh, and then uh, uh, energy portfolio and look, at a, for, uh, look for alternative energy. Importantly, and I think it's helpful, and the new mayors know this already because it's not their first day on the job uh, in elected office, if, if you are uh, if you want the private sector to follow, you really need to walk the walk first. Uh, they smell hypocrisy immediately. Uh, and so that was really what, was, what I had in mind was, let's get municipal organization doing the right thing. Then we turn to the private sector. And, and that's one of the exciting things I'm sure we're going to talk about this evening is, is, is the very enthusiastic response uh, from the private sector as they recognize the business model uh, for uh, successfully addressing climate change or energy independence, whichever way you want to look at, at the problem. Great. Uh, Mayor Hahnemann, Honolulu, uh, you've worked very hard on conservation to uh, protect the beautiful island of Oahu. Can you talk about the conflict between economic development, tourism, and protecting the environment? And I know you've uh, gone out on a limb also to push for uh, uh, mass transit on the island, which has been a little controversial. Well. In our particular community, obviously, we are in a very fragile ecosystem given our island nature and very dependent upon tourism. And tourism has to be promoted not just as an opportunity to create jobs, but it's uh, sustainability. And one of the virtues and assets of Hawaii is our people and our natural environment. So if our people do not exude the aloha spirit, which we're known for, and if our environmental infrastructure and the things that are very important to us and to visitors are not going to be maintained, then we're going to have a problem. So when I came into office, I said that I was going to go back and, and sort of harken back to what our ancestors had preached many years ago about sustainability. And they did it very well, 1,800 years ago, from the mountain to the sea. They called it the Ahu Poaha concept. So I said, let's use that wisdom plus the technology of today and hence be able to have. And what we came forward with is a sustainability plan, the first time the city's ever done it. But as Mayor Chavez is saying, I think you've got to provide incentives and motivations because even though we're an island environment, people just don't get it. Uh, and we need to continue to do that, especially now with the consciousness of global warming and the like. So it's going to take a lot of work. And oftentimes, you're going to have to bite the bullet and come up front and raise taxes. This light rail system, which to me uh, is the number one impediment to our quality of life. If we don't build transit, we're going to be suffering well into the future. I had to broach the idea of raising taxes. It's the first time we've raised taxes in over 40 years in the general excise tax. We have a decaying infrastructure. We had a major wastewater spill last year in Waikiki that could have devastated our visitor industry. Fortunately, I raised sewer fees the first year in office. I raised it the third year in office. So the money was there to fix the problem. But it's an ongoing commitment, not just from the mayor, but from everyone. They have to buy into it. Mayor Nichols, uh, tell us a little bit about signing up all of those 700 and sure. what did you say, 38? <clears throat> uh, 39. 39 yeah. mayors. and. Uh, how you've done it in Seattle sure. and, and what, what really is going on. I mean, how easy or hard has it been yeah. to uh, get those cities to walk the walk? 
First, I want to say how excited I am to be here because six years ago my election was so close that I couldn't come. I didn't want to come and be a pretender and then have to apologize if, if the um, votes turned the wrong way in the late absentees. So it's great to, to finally make it uh, here. Uh, when I got elected, it was right after 9-11, uh, Boeing, which is a major employer in the Puget Sound area, was laying off 30,000 people in commercial airplane manufacturing. We lost 100,000 jobs overall. So climate change was not on the front burner of the issues that I was dealing with. Uh, Homeland Security and creating jobs. Those were the two things that we were most focused on. But uh, we had an experience in 2004, 2005, that winter, the Cascade Mountains had a record low snowfall. And that meant no ski season, which was a tragedy for many people. Uh, but more than that, it was a very difficult situation for me as mayor because we own our electric utility, Seattle City Light, and we own our water system that supplies Seattle and about a million people around Seattle. And we get that water to run through turbines to create power and the water to run through pipes for our homes and our businesses from snowmelt. So no snow, no water, no power. And it became an issue that, that had seemed to me to be long in the future, far away, and very definitely became one that was here and now. And that's really important because that's what mayors deal with. We deal with what's happening on the streets of our city, the homes in our city, the businesses in our city on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I pledged that we would meet or exceed the reductions that Kyoto called for, that we would debunk the myth that it would destroy our economy or that it was too difficult to do. But I knew that if it were only our city, Seattle, it would be purely symbolic. It's a global problem, and one city that's less than one fraction of a percent of the population and the emissions on the globe couldn't make the difference. So that's why I reached out and I asked mayors to join with me uh, in the effort. And we hoped we'd get 141, one for every country that had signed on. We hoped we'd send the message to those other countries that there was in fact, intelligent life in America, and that we would rejoin the effort and help lead the effort to a solution. Uh, but we have far exceeded that. We now have 76 million Americans who live in the cities that have signed on to reduce their emissions by the amount called for in Kyoto. That's one in four Americans lives in our cities that have signed on. So it went from being symbolic to being something real. And that's important because when I ask people in my city to sacrifice, they want it to mean something. They want it to count for something. They don't want to just do it symbolically. So it helped us at the local level to be able to say that we're not in this alone. We're in this together with these other uh, 739 cities. So the, the challenge for us in Seattle, like in Albuquerque, was to lead by example. We reduced our corporate, our city government's emissions by 60% from 1990 levels. And then we went to the business leadership, the civic leadership, the environmental leadership and said, okay, tell us now how we can reduce our emissions by 680,000 metric tons, 7%. We put the plan together. Uh, we use that as an opportunity to uh, educate the public as to what people can do in their, their own home, their own business, where people feel the same way that I felt, which is we can't do this alone. If I turn down my thermostat or I put in a CFL bulb, that's not going to make a difference. It's a global problem. So again, we needed to educate people. Uh, and our most recent campaign is to save Santa. You all heard that the uh, polar ice cap is melting and we know that reindeer could fly. We are not sure if they can tread water. So we're talking to the kids about what that, what that means and using Santa as a, as a convenient uh, uh, prop uh, in that effort. So we're trying to find different ways to communicate to people throughout our city. This is important, and in fact, you can make a difference. And that's what the power of this movement has been. 739 mayors, we trade information. You'll find mayors that one of the great traditions is stealing ideas from one another and uh, rebranding them and, and uh, uh, taking them back home. Uh, and that really is a strength of a grassroots effort, and I think that's why we've been able to, to be as successful as we have. Now, have you got your sights on the other 400 cities? 
it, it's been interesting. I mean, who, the, is there a dirty dozen at the end that are going to be the hard <laughs> ones to get? I'm, I'm not going to name names. Uh, but we have cities in every state. All 50 states uh, have signed on. Uh, and it's been interesting, the uh, timing of that. The early states, you could guess California, cities would sign on. The West Coast, the Northeast. Then Florida cities started to sign on, and you can guess it was the hurricanes and, and the ferocity of the, the hurricanes a couple years ago. The Midwest cities started to sign on when they were experiencing drought and uh, extreme heat events. So we've all kind of come to this place from different perspectives and having experienced it in different ways. But the exciting thing to me is that we are now in common cause, and we're sharing ideas, we're sharing experiences, and we are sharing a common goal. And I think that's something that this country has not had for a long time. We did check, and Cambridge and Boston are, uh, have signed the pledge. Yeah. Uh, you don't know how well they're doing, do you? Uh, I, I met with Mayor Benito earlier today, and he assured me that Boston is, is walking, the, walking the talk. All right, Mayor uh, Palmer, uh, coming back to the East Coast. Uh, New Jersey has sometimes had the dubious reputation about pollution and the environment, and you've worked very hard in Trenton mm -hmm. to make a cleaner Trenton, to work for energy efficiency, to have your own green initiative. And uh, yet I, you were quoted uh, at that summit earlier that uh, you can't just say we need to reduce global warming because of floods and polar bears. They would run me out of town. So how do you sell it in Trenton? That's good. And, you know, first, it's great to be here. And, uh, you know, I came out here. I didn't know who I would see. I knew I wouldn't know anybody. But then I see Victor Ash, who uh, is past president of this organization from Knoxville and ambassador to Poland, and my good friend over here, Bill Purcell, the mayor of Nashville. Then I see somebody local. Talk about local. I see uh, my man, John, John Bensavango, mayor of Hamilton Township, who's our, our, our neighbor, and David Cicilline from Providence. So it's great to be here. You know, I just want to tell you the perspective from the Northeast. And like global warming, what is that? You know, sometimes, you know, certainly in, in California and Seattle and, and Oregon, who are a little more echo conscious than in the Northeast, uh, they're farther ahead. And quite frankly, I have to tell you, when they talked about global warming and climate change, I thought it was a good thing because all I know is dealing with budgets, and I know the new mayors are here. And whenever it snows, you're worried, I'm telling you. You're worried about overtime costs, and then you're worried about the little old lady on the phone that's saying, I've been looking out my window for three hours, and I haven't seen the snow plow come out yet. And I would say, stop looking out the window, enjoy yourself, they'll be there. But I was saying, you know what? In Trent, New Jersey, in the Northeast, it's warm. The winters are warm, and I don't have to have snow, and uh, as a result, you know, I don't have to pay overtime and hear complaints. I said, man, this global warming is all right. <laughs> Until I became enlightened and recognized that this is just not something that so-called tree huggers or environmentalists are just hollering about, which they were farther ahead than us. But it's reality. And so in the Northeast, we look at, first of all, uh, their older industrial cities. And we have, you know, those problems. Uh, Mass transit, we're not up on mass transit as well as we should. We're trying to green urban cities as well. But I recognized it was important on the environment for the environment and what we had to do to save our planet. I drive a hybrid now. Let me tell you, I, I was driving a, a Lincoln Town car, and my five-year-old was used to it. But I got into this, and if I'm president of the United States Conference of Mayors, I'm trying to set an example, I had to get a hybrid. First thing my, my five-year-old said, Daddy, this car is a lot smaller. I said, but it's better, baby. You'll, you'll like it. <laughs> but I don't drive a hybrid for me. I drive it for her and her kids. And so we have to set an example. And I also recognize that in neighborhoods, and John knows this, city of Trenton, you know, we're fighting crime like everybody here, and people are out of work, and they're saying, well, I can't get a job, I'm going to resort, which is an excuse to doing this or doing that. But I had to make sure that people in my city recognized, how does global warming affect you? Because that quote, if I came back and said to the people in the hood, oh, we got to save the planet, 
we got to make sure the polar ice caps are good and that the polar bears aren't extinct. They say, Palmer, not only have you lost your hair, you have lost your mind. You have to make this issue relevant to whatever section of your population that you're talking about because, quite frankly, it's all relevant, whether it's reducing energy costs, which help the bottom line in budgets, whether it's having an a eco-friendly city where businesses will come, whether it's creating green collar, not just jobs, but careers. And that's one of the things as we're refining our carbon footprint and looking at reducing our carbon footprint and planting more trees, it's also making sure that people that are unemployed, underemployed, or coming out of the prisons with hardly any skills to say, look, we're going to create green collar careers, whether it's retrofitting buildings for solar panels, uh, whether it's bringing plants into the city that can help that, whether it's looking at putting green roofs on buildings that can cr create jobs, and all the jobs that, that we don't even know the limit of those jobs yet to get people involved in that aspect in the neighborhoods. Or senior citizens. Last, well, it's still November, a few weeks ago, senior citizen event I had, and I talked to these seniors about CFLs. First of all, I said, how many people know what CFLs are? I don't think two people out of 500 raised their hand. Then I said, those curly Q light bulbs. Then five people raised their hands. I said, how many people use them? Then one person raised their hand. But when I talked about, because they were ready to party, they wanted to dance, but when I started talking about saving energy by getting a CFL the last five to eight years that is helping the environment, that, that it can continue to reduce you know, your dependence on oil, how we can retrofit your buildings and your homes. They listen, so you talk about those kinds of things. So in Trenton, we have, with a partnership with Public Service Electric and Gas, the governor's office created a Trenton Green Initiative where we're finding our carbon footprint, uh, where we're also not only doing that, putting a workforce component to that as well, and educating the, the folks. The biggest thing is changing human behavior because people are used to doing the same things all the time. And that's one of the hardest things to change human behavior. So in, in Trenton, we're doing it. But without the leadership of this gentleman here and these folks here, Mayor Shirley Franklin, who was at this conference, I guess she had to leave, and Mayor Dixon from Baltimore, uh, who's doing great things. The US Conference of Mayors took what this man started. We, we have over 739. It continues to grow, but not just signing up. Because you know, mayors sign up. Oh yeah, I'll sign a pledge. You know how that comes by, petitions. Oh yeah, I'll sign that petition. Could be your own recall petition. Yeah, I'll <laughs> sign it, but they sign, yeah, I'm gonna sign up for global warming. What does that mean? And so with the United States Conference of Mayors and working with our leadership here, we, we had a uh, US Conference of Mayors Climate Protection Center where now any mayor, you new mayors, can go on our web, talk to our organization. They'll, ain't no, ain't no, excuse me, ain't. I'm in Harvard. There's not any need <laughs> to reinvent the wheel. <clears throat> Look on the website, steal the idea, put your face on it, and have global initiative. This will tell you how to go about doing it. And it's important that all of us do that. And to the new mayors, it's important that you do it because you don't have the luxury, and I'm going to stop in a minute. You don't have the luxury, like certain people in Congress. You know, God bless them. But in Congress, I asked uh, uh, Mayor Dellums, who's now mayor of Oakland, but he was in Congress for over two decades. What's the difference when you became a mayor between being in Congress and being a mayor? In a second, he said, the difference is when you're in Congress, you can pick and choose your issues. Or you're on the Banking Committee, or you're on the Environment Committee, or in the Education Committee. But when you're mayor, you don't have the luxury to pick and choose every issue, whether it's education, crime, global warming, the foreclosure crisis, everything comes to, to us. And what's important for mayors to understand that our citizens are looking for leadership, but also global warming is an issue that you can educate the people and you can get them behind a solid issue like that. So in Trenton, we're following the lead of these folks. The Conference of Mayors helps us. And uh, I think we're going we're gonna to get there. With all this enthusiasm, uh, what kind of roadblocks have any of the others of you run into? Obviously, there is not universal acceptance. There's concerns sometimes about the economic costs. 
um, really upfront and whether this is really going to make a difference, especially with cities? I think it's all about changing behavior uh, and also recognizing, and I remember it, uh, Mayor Menino told me this in my first year in office, 2005, after I signed <laughs> on uh, first year in office. He says, believe it or not, uh, young man, <laughs> I was happy to be called a young man, uh, mayors have the toughest job in America because you have to have an opinion on everything. And when there's a lack of leadership uh, on an issue at the federal state level, it's going to become all politics is local. And so I think in, in my regards, Honolulu is no different than Albuquerque, Seattle, and Trenton. It's changing behavior. I mean, people look at Hawaii and say, it's a paradise. You don't have any environmental problems. We do. We have as many cars as we do residents. Uh, we import 85% of our food. We are 93% dependent on fossil fuels. Uh, we are sending too, many, too much of our municipal waste to the landfill. So these are major issues that are no different than other urban areas. And I think what's important is that someone's got to step up. To me, I found it very difficult to fathom that my predecessors never put together a sustainability plan. And that's one of the first things that I did. I laid out a vision. I came up with a plan. I put together departments. And I think they all said the same thing. You must lead by example. So my city vehicle is a hybrid. My personal vehicle is a hybrid. And you know, I took a lot of ribbon for that, too. A big guy, six foot seven, trying to drive a hybrid. <laughs> Uh, but you know, it has to be done. It's not the popular thing to do, it's the right thing to do. And when people see their leaders, their mayors doing it, then it makes it easier for the senior citizen, the youth group, and so forth. And I just want to commend Harvard in that regard. I'm not saying this because of my alma mater, but I understand 83.8% .8 of the student body voted that you wanted to have very strict guidelines to reducing uh, fossil fuels and your dependence uh, upon alternative, and I should say, then uh, uh, emphasizing the use of alternative energy. Uh, sources and, and coming on the fight against global warming. And then I saw that the Sierra Club uh, rated Harvard University as one of the top 10 cool universities in the country. I mean, you're having total buy-in here with the students, with the faculty, and that's good. And that's what should be the model through all the cities uh, throughout America. And if the mayors have to lead, and that's why I think what Mayor Nichols did was a good thing, mayors lead. If your governor is not leading, if your congressman is not leading, we're not getting leadership at the national level lead at the local level and everything else will follow. Let's talk for a minute about um, the fact that there's so many initiatives. You've got the cities, uh, some of the states have stepped forward like California, and some people think that the regional initiatives, there's a western one, a midwestern one, a New England one, may be more effective, more efficient, eliminate duplication. So how do you coordinate as cities with states and regions and not create a patchwork of contradictory or confusing initiatives? Well, I mean, fortunately, the job is so big that that hasn't yet become a problem. Uh, the, the challenge, and what every mayor signs on to when they sign the U.S. Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement is, is two things. One, we'll take local action to reduce our emissions by 7% from 1990 levels, what Kyoto would have called for if we were uh, uh, part of that accord. The second thing is that we will advocate for federal policies, cap and trade system, um, and uh, other federal policies so that the United States as a country gets back in the game. Because that's what it's going to take. Kyoto just scratches the surface. If we don't reduce our emissions by something like 80% by 2050, this is going to become an irreversible um, phenomena. And we can't afford to let that happen. So we're taking the first steps at the grassroots level. We're showing that we can. We, we can come up with strategies that reduce our emissions. We can do it without destroying our economies. In fact, we can do it by creating green industries and green careers in our cities and giving ourselves a future. Uh, and we can make it safe for the politicians in the state capitals and the politicians in Washington, D.C. to take up this issue and take action themselves. And, and you know, can I just say this? You know, there's a big effort, you know, some people, politicians in Washington will say, well, you know, China and India, they're big polluters and they want to keep their economy going. They saw how America, you know, you didn't worry about the environment when you were trying to build your economy. You can't ask, and this is something I got from President Clinton, who was a part of our Clinton uh, Climate Initiative Partnership, which is reduced, if, if mayors in our cities, if we're not leading by example, making sure that our, our buildings and our fleets are energy efficient, our citizens are not going to follow us. So part of the Clinton Initiative partnership with the U.S. Conference of Mayors has been, 
He's going to help flood the market and reduce prices so that we can get the materials and the supplies in our city buildings to reduce uh, our, our emissions. And then later working on how we can also flood the market like he did with AIDS medicine in Africa, reducing the price by doing retrofitting in homes in our city. So we have to, we have to show how we can do that as well as when we were in Atlanta just a little over a year ago with Mayor Franklin, Shirley Franklin, and Home Depot and Walmart, how they have green supplies and, and they use those supplies to, to build, and how Mayor Diaz in, in Miami brings together architects and builders to show them, look, it's not going to cost you more money to build this way, but it's all about us communicating, networking, and showing what we can do. Because if we can lead in city halls and, and state houses and in the state, show by example that we can reduce energy efficiency and still have a strong economy, then you'll have China and India and the others follow suit. But unless we have a federal policy and make this a priority, which we're going to Iowa with our 10-point plan, which our energy environment block brand is a part of, if we don't lead, if the world doesn't see us lead from the White House to the city halls, then you can't ask somebody else to lead. How, how much change? So we, we've talked, you've all been critical of Washington and uh, Have I? <laughs> the Bush administration and the Congress and the lack of action. Do you see that changing? Do you see it becoming a major presidential uh, election issue? And is it bipartisan or is it? Uh, can, I, can I just finish this and let these? Yes. And, and we have someone who's seeking to go to Washington, so maybe he's, he's going to take Chavez. a step down and go from mayor all the way to U.S. senator. But our organization is 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 bipartisan, nonpartisan, and we put a ten-point plan together: strong cities, strong families for a strong America. A little over a year ago, in a bipartisan way, working on a number of issues that will make this country strong. We put it together with our working committees and working mayors, and we have been uh, putting this 10-point plan out throughout Congress and the White House. That's, why, that's one of the reasons why we're going to Iowa, we're going to New Hampshire. We're going to make domestic issues a top priority in the election. We recognize that Iraq, Iraq is a problem, but quite frankly, when you talk about homeland security, you can't have homeland security without hometown security. And we want our issues to be on the front burner. In a bipartisan way, we'll be in Iowa. We'll be pushing our 10-point plan. And we know that a lot of the presidential candidates already have talked about energy efficiency, have talked about the impact of global warming, are ready to take the lead. So uh, the mayors are on the front lines, and we're going to keep pushing this agenda. And we see Democrat. this isn't even a Democrat, Republican, or independent issue. This is an issue about keeping America strong and secure reducing our dependence on foreign oil so that we're not giving monies to people that want to blow us up. And so we need to do all those things, and I believe that the Congress, Democrat and Republican and Independent, and the presidential candidates are beginning to get it and to understand. Mayor Chavez, you have many comments? Well, absolutely. There's a growing sense that Washington's starting to get it. They still don't have it. Uh, but. but uh, from my perspective, I think everybody running for president, both sides of the aisle, agrees that, that climate change is man-induced. And that's a major transformation in, in, in thinking. Uh, because if you don't believe it's man-induced, then there's no need for solution. <clears throat> I'm frustrated uh, because now, now I'm a Democrat. Uh, Democrats are in control of Congress. Uh, but they haven't produced anything, nothing, uh, on this issue of any substance. and so. It is not a partisan issue. It's an issue of status quo versus change. And the change either happens or we, we it's not an issue of saving the planet. It's whether our species is going to be here on the planet. The planet will be just fine, whether it's an ice age status or, or, or however it may be. Uh, but you can see the growing sense that this is a real issue. Uh, and one of the things I would hope we would all do uh, is press these presidential candidates, both sides of that. What are you going to do? Uh, I suspect that when gasoline hits $4 a gallon, uh, then a lot of people are going to wake up. Uh, and that's one of the beauties of this issue uh, in, in terms of providing a leadership opportunity uh, for, for mayors is if, if your folks still believe in the flat earth, and so be it. Uh, but they understand energy independence. And if they don't quite get energy independence, they also understand the need to create jobs 
and there's tremendous opportunity. We're just scratching the surface in, in this new green economy uh, for the potential and what it can mean for this country. We're going to open. Do you want to comment? Talk. And if, uh, in the meantime, mm -hmm. questions, get ready for those. I just saw recently a survey that was conducted by the Pew Institute. And, and I'm not one always to read polls or surveys because if I believed the polls, I never would have been, been here tonight. I would have lost my election. But be that as it may, it said, um, you know, basically eight out of 10 Americans recognize that global warming is an issue, but only four of 10 say that it's a priority. And I think that's exactly what it has to come down to. I don't think our presidential contenders nor Washington is gonna pay attention. And I think this is one of these things that has to come from the people themselves to say this is important and we want them to pay attention. And that's why this uh, energy development block grant uh, that the mayors have, and thanks to Mayor Palmer, has made it our first issue of our 10-point plan. Uh, it's very important because we're using a proven successful model of the community development block grant. And this and is to get federal money Federal to funds to be used for energy efficiency, to reduce our dependence on, on fossil fuels and the like. So it really has to come, I really believe, from this grassroots effort to say to our candidates when they come to the forums, okay, we heard your issues on health care, the war in Iraq, terrorism, education. What are you going to do about global warming? And, and, and that's important. If, if we don't press it at the grassroots level, they're going to ignore it because they'll look at the same surveys I'm looking at. Only four of 10 Americans see it's a priority. They'll go, let me continue to talk about education and health care and the war in Iraq and terrorism. So we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. There, we've got four mics, two here, two up there. If you can identify yourself and make your question brief, and if you wanted to go to a specific mayor, uh, let them know. Start here. Thank you. Does this work? Yeah. Uh, my name is Fred Clark. I live in Boston. <clears throat> uh, it seems like the polar bear is the canary in the coal mine. So if the kids want to relate to the polar bear, then fine. But it's not really about the polar bear ultimately, although that might be a nice hook to educate the kids. Uh, the science seems to show that um, um, some places are better for agriculture with a warmer planet and some places are worse. So some places will gain, like less snow for people who don't like snow and more snow in other areas for people who do like snow. So my question is, um, <clears throat> well, first a cautionary tale about the polar bear. It's not really going to be that helpful beyond helping the kids uh, connect with the issue. But to all the mayors, um, all of your public schools have really, really, really large roofs open to the sky. When are you going to put solar panels on all of the damn schools? And I've been doing the numbers on my own house, and it's not quite cost effective yet. So uh, we've got a lot of uh, distance to go for incentives and all the other packages to make it cost effective. But uh, what's the plan to make our schools energy and carbon neutral? Well, <clears throat> and each of us would have a different, different story. In Seattle, uh, our electric utility, Seattle City Light, it, uh, produces zero net greenhouse gas emissions, none. So when you flip a light switch in Seattle, you are not toasting the planet. Uh, that's because we have hydro resources that we can rely on. We've gotten rid of coal that was part of our portfolio, replaced it with wind, uh, and we've emphasized uh, uh, conservation since we had a very bad experience in Washington State with nuclear power 30 years ago. So, um, so our challenge is a little bit different in terms of trying to make sure that uh, uh, we use that energy efficiently and we don't have to go out and build a plant that would create new emissions. Uh, and uh, we're finding that people are very receptive in terms of changing their, their lighting uh, we are giving away lots of CFL bulbs. We're asking people to voluntarily contribute to a green fund, even though, again, we don't make any emissions. Every kilowatt that we save, we can sell to California, and California can turn off a, a, a gas turbine or a coal plant. So, uh, so we recognize that we do have that as one of our continuing goals. Conserve, 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 uh, and replace any fossil fuels with renewable um, resources. And you know, that's why it's so important that the issue we're pushing, the energy environment block grant that has gone through the Senate and Congress. Cities, we don't have the, y'all know, you don't, we don't have the resources to fight crime and education and then try to 
you know, do what we feel is a federal responsibility in a partnership with us. That's why the block grant, $2 billion a year for five years, will help municipalities once they develop their plan or help them develop the plan and say, what are we doing with schools? What are we doing with public housing? What are we doing with businesses? What are we doing with our own? Our own? You could, for example, say, because schools are great because they have flat roofs, and depending on where you are in the, in the region, you could say, okay, we're, what we're going to do is assess where we can put these flat roofs on schools. Or, as you know, especially in the inner city where you have a lot of schools, asthma is a big problem. This is an environmental, environmental justice issue with asthma and what's going on in the environment. Buses idle in front of public schools all the time. You can retrofit the buses. So the Energy Environment Block Grant can help those things as well. The more people in this country that do this, it will reduce the cost of everything that we're doing because it'll be greater. And that's how we're, we're trying to uh, do all these things. All right, let's, um, let's go over here for a qu um, brief question, OK? Good evening. Uh, my name is Tom Henry. I'm mayor-elect the city of Fort Wayne, Indiana. First of all, I enjoyed reading your 10-point plan. Uh, and I think it has a tremendous amount of promise. However, one of the initiatives is to ask for additional funding through block grant money for the continuation of green technology and green applications. Yet over the past several years, the federal, federal government's been tightening the screws on block grant money. So what, what do you see as the true probability of not only that particular initiative, but the entire 10-point plan being implemented? That's why we're going to Iowa. And actually, that's why, you know, just to give you briefly, when the Congress changed a, a year ago, and we're Democrat, Republican, Independent, we recognized this was an opportunity. We came together. We have more than 10 issues, but our 10 priorities. We met with Speaker Pelosi and, and Senator Reid, and we met with Republican leadership to go over our 10-point plan. They came to our winter meeting in January. Many endorse the plan. We continue to add parts to the 10-point plan, like the foreclosure uh, crisis is a part of our, our housing and economic development thing. So that's why we're going to Iowa, which is unprecedented. You know, we've never gone as, in 75 years, the Mayor Davenport smiling. We're going to Iowa. We're going to New Hampshire, maybe Nevada, uh, and South Carolina, because they can't ignore mayors. When they want to get elected, you know, Mayor, when they want to get elected, they come see us. But they're going to see us. We're going to be in their face. And we believe through the Congress, what's happening with our Energy Environment Block Grant, with our COPS, $110 billion uh, block grant that they're working on, that our issues will be heard. But quite frankly, mayors can't do it alone. It's up to us to engage our citizens so they can also make sure that these domestic issues our priority, but I'm optimistic. I'm, we're all hopeful, and we're all doing a great job, every one of us, to push it. And both the Senate and the House have the Energy and Environment Block Grant in their energy bills yes. that have passed. The legislation is sponsored by Jeff Bingaman, who's senior senator from New Mexico and chairman of the Senate Energy, uh, and it's extraordinarily important. Uh, we absolutely need federal uh, partnership for air quality standards, national energy policy, uh, foreign policy, uh, but carbons come from where people live and they live mostly in cities. Uh, and so it makes sense. And if you're in a smaller community, and the big issue is how do you get money to fix the, uh, the culvert that washed out last week, well, saving the planet may not be right up there in the immediate priority. So this, this provides money to local governments so they can actually engage in, in these different initiatives. We'll go up, up there. Let me just add something yes. there. I'm sanguine as, as, as a new mayor is because with this organization, I know that the Community Development Block Grant Program would have been toast. And the mayor's not stepped up to the U.S. Conference of Mayors. So it's been cut, but it's there. So all we're saying is use the same model. It's helped us at that level. This is the wave of the future. This is why we need your help. Yes, up there. Yes, my name is George Njaparidza. I'm here. At, I'm a student at the Kennedy School doing a master's in public policy. Uh, first of all, I want to commend all of you on your leadership. It is inspiring to see leadership of this kind. It, it is leadership that is much needed in this country. Um, my question is actually a policy question. Um, you have talked a lot about the efforts that are being done on the mitigation side, um, and that's something that has been a focus of the climate change issue more recently. But have you done anything or have you thought about the adaptation challenges 
and how does that come into things like your sustainability plan and future action? I'm a co-chairman of the Water Council, which is an adjunct to the National Conference of Mayors, and, and adaptation has been our principal focus. If we do everything right today, we know that there's still going to be adverse impacts of the carbon buildup in our, in our atmosphere. So, uh, water system readiness, storm, ready, uh, storm system ready, uh, readiness, uh, sewer, and we, all we have to look at is New Orleans and see what happens when you're not fully prepared. Uh, but what you find out when you go down that road is that the, the gap between what we have and what we need is enormous. Uh, and it absolutely uh, calls into, into, into the conversation the need for federal assistance in this. You're absolutely right. The, the, even if we were phenomenally successful in reversing the trend and uh, getting to Kyoto and then getting beyond Kyoto by 2050, there's enough carbon already in the atmosphere that we will see a change uh, in the climate. So, uh, as I said before, our concern, my concern that brought me to this issue was the snowpack in the Cascades. It's been reducing uh, significantly since the end of World War II, and they tell me it will be cut in half again in the next 30 years. So, we manage our water supply very differently today than we did 10 years ago so that we can have a sustainable supply of water. As a region, we use less water today than we did in 1960, even though we have 400,000 more customers. So conservation, uh, managing those systems uh, in a different fashion, uh, and adaptation will be absolutely important. But it can't divert us from the idea that this generation has a responsibility to change the way that we are treating this planet so that that adaptation isn't the only strategy. Got a question up there. Hi, my name is Jason Elliott. I'm a master student here at the Kennedy School. Before my question, I want to commend the organizers of this event. I think this is the only school-wide public event, and to choose the topic of climate change for the one school-wide public event, I think that's great, and I think that they should be commended for that. It's important, and I'm glad that they did that. Uh, my question, if, you, if any of you had experience with uh, economic development and uh, the term I'd never heard before, green collar jobs, I thought that was great. If you, could, uh, if you could talk about any positive experiences, successful experiences you've had in attracting and retaining businesses with uh, utility incentives, tax incentives, city code, uh, zoning laws, anything, anything that's worked so that uh, other mayors can, can learn from your experience. One of the areas that we focused on, uh, you know, there, there are two major sources of, of carbon in our country, and they're, they're about equal, and that's buildings and transportation. And uh, so on the building side, uh, we have, as a city, uh, led by example again by uh, building uh, numerous LEED certified buildings. Our city hall is LEED gold. Our new downtown library is LEED silver. We have uh, it, depending on what week it is, either Seattle or Portland has the largest portfolio of LEED buildings. Uh, and so we are creating, we think, a reputation of being the green building capital of America. We have architects and engineers, we have uh, manufacturing uh, uh, businesses and technology businesses all figuring out how we can make buildings more efficient. We're, we did that first for ourselves. And now we're doing that and marketing that as one of the things that Seattle uh, has to offer to the uh, country and the world economy. So we've seen a great increase in that. We started now in Seattle, uh, a person building a condominium, if they don't build it green, they're going to have a dis distinct disadvantage when they go into the marketplace. So the market is now demanding those lead buildings uh, in Seattle. So. Uh, Yes, we have had very good uh, experience with that, and we're seeing that sector uh, beginning to form in our city. Yes, over here. Hi, my name is Simi Bott, and I'm a senior at the college, and I want to thank you all for coming, discussing this really important issue with us. Um, so you all spoke about the importance of leading by example, but also you know, dealing with the actualities of city government, including the tight budgets. Um, but since you've all accomplished such wonderful things, I was wondering where that initial investment really came from and, and how you were able to get the money together to start doing green things. Well, if you take what I'm trying to do in Honolulu, which is to build uh, a light rail system that's been pursued by my city for over 40 years, 16 years ago, the lesson was this. 
Honolulu said no by a city council vote to five to four to $620 million of federal funds authorized, appropriated, ready to go. They would have built it then. Uh, other cities went yippee because they grabbed that money as soon as it disappeared. So I knew if we were going to broach the subject this time, we had to put our money where our mouth is. And that's why I said to my fellow mayor, sometimes you're going to have to stand up there and raise the T word. And that's what I did. Uh, and it's a general excise tax, interestingly, that doesn't come from the city, it came from the state. So I had to really lobby the state legislature to increase the general excise tax for the first time in over 40 years to finance this by half percent. It's not easy. Uh, people are always coming back and saying, I didn't want their taxes to be paid for this very costly system, if you will. But I think that's when, as a mayor, you have to say, then, what is your alternative? And as I said earlier, Honolulu has over 900,000 residents. We're the 13th largest city in the United States. A lot of people don't realize that. But we have as many registered cars as we do people. And all the alternatives that people point out to me cannot replace what a rail system will do. And Al Gore said it best in the inconvenient truth. If you want to fight global warming, support light rail slash mass transit. So I'm bullish about this. I know this is all about future generations really benefiting from it because we're going to build it out. But then there are other aspects that you try to explain to people too. With rail comes transit-oriented development, opportunities to revitalize community, create green jobs, green industries, open space, affordable housing. That's a tangible benefit. And then when you pitch it as part of an integrated multimodal system, where you're going to increase bike lanes so people who ride their bikes can do it, walkable lanes. We started a boat service and our excellent bus uh, system as it is. Then I say to folks, it's all about choices. And that's what you want. You want to provide your residents with choices. So, so far, so good. It's not easy. We get tremendous pushback. But when you say, where's that money going to come from? Sometimes the government has to start it. And then you look for partnerships, private investment, federal funds, to move these initiatives forward. Is, is the light rail approved then, and when will it be? We're going to break ground in 2009. And so how long will it take to finish? For, the, for 20 miles, it'll take us eight years, 2009 to 2017. Now, when you consider that the tax was raised in 2005 and I'm breaking ground in four years, that's a lot of progress in such a short time. You know, it's, it's a great question, though, because it's exactly what we get asked is, uh, you know, why are you spending more money to build this building to this, this lead silver status or gold status? What, you know, you could use that money somewhere else. Uh, and, and that's part of the challenge. One of the first things that I proposed after we adopted our city plan was a commercial parking tax, 10% commercial parking tax. I don't have the authority to do a congestion charge like London, but I can raise the cost of parking, which moves people to transit. And the lead editorial in our local paper was, well, we're proud of Mayor Nichols leading on this issue, but we didn't actually think he was going to do anything. Um, so you have to get people thinking about how these how these investments um, pay off. So we've shown how we've reduced our electricity use, how we've uh, reduced our use of water, and therefore saved money. And then we, in turn, we reinvest that in additional uh, improvements. Yeah, and there, there are non-tax alternatives as well. We set aside, we started at 1%. We're now up to 3% of our entire capital budget goes to these types of initiatives. And so you force the pain to be spread amongst your bureaucrats somewhat equally, uh, or as best they can do. But we haven't had to raise taxes to do these things, and, and we've put uh, substantial dollars, LED light conversion for traffic signals, you name it. They're funded through that special fund, and that's essentially a block grant at the local level. There's a number of ways you do it, but the bottom line is we, as mayors, want to be held accountable, whether we get block grants or what we're held accountable to what we do in our own cities. Hold us accountable for the results, and we'll clear, clearly show them. And as you see, once you begin to invest and when the savings come, you reinvest those savings and they continue what you're doing. And we want to be held accountable. We don't have any problems being held accountable for how we use the money and what benefits will come. Over here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mitch Hunter. I am the co-chair of the Harvard Environmental Action Committee, an undergraduate group. Um, I want to thank Mayor Hanneman for your praise of what Harvard has done so far. Um, but I'd also... Um, we're dealing with an issue similar to what you guys have put together um, with the the group of mayors that have come together. We're asking President Faust to sign the American College and University President's Climate Commitment, um, which is essentially the same thing on the level of colleges and universities with slightly different goals. Um, and we've uh, frankly run into a little bit of um, resistance, I should say. Um, but 
and, and some, some of the resistance has to do with something that you, Mayor Palmer, pointed to, which is that many of these schools may have simply signed and it could have been their own, their own recall petition. Um, so my question for you is, you've mentioned how the collective of mayors has been a very positive thing and that has driven innovation across cities. Um, how has it worked in, in terms of enforcing accountability? Because I understand there's you know, a certain goal laid out. Um, and how are, how are you using this collective as a tool to bring mayors on board and also make sure that they actually do the things that they say they're going to do? Real quick, because they, they could do this too. The best thing is, you know, uh, what, what do they say? Um, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. When other mayors see what other mayors are doing and how the effect is and how it's helping, they'll get on board. And a lot of times, your citizens, especially on an issue like this, but on a lot of issues, but especially this issue on climate change, your citizens are farther ahead than, I know they were farther ahead than I was, but I've caught up and I'm getting farther than a lot of them now. But they're farther. I mean, we're farther now, but your citizens know a lot about these kinds of things. And you'd be surprised if you bring them together, whether you have commissions on green commissions, or even your own city halls. Ask, you know, have a box lunch and say, who wants to talk about green initiatives and how we can save money in City Hall? You would be amazed at who would even come to those and begin to share your ideas. Like anything, change comes from the grassroots, and you have to have this grassroots initiative through your alumni association, through the students, through the business community. And believe me, uh, you know, speak truth to power, and it'll happen. I think the thing is to recognize is you try to impact or influence the things that you have control over or responsibility over. You know, uh, the city of Honolulu uh, is one of four counties in the state of Hawaii. So I said, I'm not going to worry about what the state's going to do. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to drive it from the city and county of Honolulu. And then I looked at it another way. If I'm three-fourths of the state's population, if I'm three-fourths of the tax base, then if you look at the state of Hawaii as a basketball team, I'm the Kevin Garnett of this basketball team of the state of Hawaii. If I do well, if I promote initiatives in the environment, Obviously, three-fourths of the populace are going to like it. The majority of the tourists are we're on it. So that's why I started with the vision, signing on uh, with Mayor Nichols on the Kyoto Accords, and then drilling down. I convened an interdepartmental group, first time we've ever done that, with specific short-term goals, long-term goals, and then how I'm going to hold our feet to the fire is my advisory board is not adults. I've got high schoolers. That's my advisory board. I call them ambassadors. And they're going to drive this program so that long after I'm mayor, it's going to have some sustenance and sustainability, and it's going to go forward. I think this is a good question, though, and we talked about it briefly. I don't think there are, at this point, consistent measures, and that's one thing that would be helpful in comparing cities. Yeah. And so what are you going to do in terms, now that you've got all of these people signed up, is there someone trying to design some consistency as to how you measure emissions, what counts, what mm -hmm. doesn't count? Mm -hmm. And it's a great question. It's a political question in that uh, every mayor who signs on is doing it voluntarily. And they're doing it because something happened in their community. Uh, they, they became enlightened through some kind of a, a threat they saw to their city. Uh, or, you know, local citizens petitioned them. Uh, we started to see a bunch of cities in Missouri sign on. We were wondering, why Missouri? Well, it turned out there was an organizer from the Sierra Club who was going city to city and, and uh, being very effective. So the next level is not voluntary. It's going to be some regulation, incentive, and standards of how we measure our emissions and how we measure the improvements that we're making. And that's why the second part of our, uh, our agreement is we need to lobby the federal government. We need to get action at the federal level to create that playing field create the markets that will allow us to go an order of magnitude beyond Kyoto. So you asking the question here in front of uh, uh, the campus and uh, uh, in other ways making sure that the administration understands that signing it was not just a symbolic act but a commitment um, is exactly what's happening in our cities. A question up there. Thank you. I'm Ronald Jones, the mayor of Garland, Texas. We, didn't, we did, couldn't quite hear. Uh, Mayor of? Garland, Texas, about 21 miles northeast of Dallas, Texas, population of about 225,000. Uh, shortly after I, I took the seat of uh, mayor, I was visited by an environmental group, 
that briefed me on the Cool Cities program, and then I got a packet of information. I made arrangements with my mayor to place this on the council agenda, and then found out that the previous mayor had assigned this to a committee. Long story short, at my last council meeting, I directed that committee to report, inform them that I would be taking action on this. I want to know how you went about it, though, mayors. Now, I'm going to sign this, but I want to, I have three new councilmen that I'm trying to enroll into my camp, if you will. Did you simply take the lead, sign it, and then enroll them into it, or did you sell them on it and then sign it? Well, e and every city has a different way of doing it. In, in many cities, the mayor is selected by the council as opposed to directly elected, and therefore oh, we've, had, elected. we've had county, okay. uh, or rather council, uh, resolutions and motions. In other cities, uh, there's a mayor, there's a council manager form of government, and mm -hmm. they go through a different process. So it's whatever works in the particular city. In my city, uh, I'm a, an independently elected mayor. I'm the CEO of the city, and I, I not only signed it, I started it. So uh, it's All right, an thank easy you. decision. And I will us. be signing it, though, gentlemen. Good. I appreciate you. Good. Welcome but, aboard. But I would I'll advise, you. Mayor, that you also take it to the streets. You know, yeah. go in to the senior citizen centers, if you have public housing, to the business community, get a ground swelling of support when you get the information so you can articulate some things that are relevant to whatever constituency that you're talking about. And then when they come to the council meeting, you don't have to worry about what the council folks are doing. They'll be behind you know, your plan. I, I, I would go and visit with uh, your editorial boards of your daily newspapers. I will. I did find yeah. out this was more political than I thought. Uh, several people have worked on my campaign, Democrats, Republicans, uh, one of my good friends, who was the leader, told me initially, he said, oh, look, Ron, you don't want to sign it. He had been on the previous council. He said, this is nothing but a Democratic hoax. I said, what do you mean? When people get asked me, you're blaming that on a Democrat? He's, and, and I talked to the pre previous mayor. I met with him. He said, well, Ron, we really do all of those things, but we just don't want to call it that, whatever that meant. They didn't, want, they didn't like the term uh, climate, uh, global warming. That's what I found out. But we're going to take the lead on this and, and go ahead and do it. Thank you. We call it climate protection now. Oh, climate yeah, we call change, we call it climate, climate, uh, climate protection. protection now. Uh, we've got time for only a couple more questions. Could you make it real brief so we can okay. get a few Jim more? Jim Fouts, uh, recently elected Mayor Warren. Um, I would just like to state, I'm from the state of Michigan. We have a serious economic problem. We're very dependent on the automobiles. Your former president of Harvard spoke to us yesterday and he indicated we're getting ready for a recession and um, China is increasing at a rapid rate. So with all these problems, how am I going to be able to sell to my community, particularly to the Detroit area where we're located? We are the third largest city in the state, but we're dwarfed by Detroit. How am I going to be able to sell that? The three of you, with all due respect, New Mexico, Honolulu, and Seattle, those are great places. Those are environmentally friendly. Mr. Palmer, you, you are, are the guy, you're the cheerleader that I'd like to have campaign in Michigan. Let, let me because, start off. Yeah. In Washington State, we build airplanes, and airplanes use fossil fuels. Okay. So 10 years ago, we were getting our lunch eaten by Airbus, and uh, we were losing jobs, market share, and we weren't sure that we were going to be making airplanes uh, here in the 21st century. And the way that Boeing has regained its uh, position in the market is by being more efficient, by reducing the uh, amount of fuel that it uses uh, in its new generation of airplanes. Now, they got a long way to go. But if the state of Michigan and the voters of Michigan said to the presidential candidates that we're not going to support anybody unless they make a pledge that the United States will produce the greenest vehicles on the face of the planet by 2012, and you do that research in our state, uh, we're not going to support you. I think that you will see a whole different debate than you have today over CAFE standards. You'll start to set the pace rather than reacting to what the uh, other companies like Toyota are doing to you. And I think what, what you have to do is, again, go back to the citizens. Understand what the problems are. I just came from Detroit yesterday. We did a whole big thing on the foreclosure disgrace Major and crisis. And some people want to blame the borrowers. Some people, there's culpability all around. Some people want to blame the borrowers. Some people want to say, oh, you lost jobs, so this is going to happen. I think you have to look at your city and your region on what's happening. But certainly, climate change and reducing your energy costs 
and getting people behind that initiative is going to help the bottom line. And looking at ways in which, you know, you're not going to maybe right now make the money that you would make, you know, with the car, you know, be, you know doing cars and working for uh, the auto industry. But begin to also look at ways in which you can create another economy and not just green collar jobs but careers out of what will happen as a result of energy efficiency. You know, again, I go back to uh, Mayor Bloomberg that said this in Seattle. He said that clean energy and that whole industry is the oil gusher of the 21st century. It's just how we find out how in our own niches, whether it's in the Northeast, the South, what your economy is going to do and how you can make that competitive. But it's going to require, quite frankly, leadership from the mayors, straight talk, and getting people to buy in, and this is what we have to do. But you have to do this anyway in order to reduce costs, but also tie it. I'm trying to tie it in a number of areas, but tie it with jobs as well. Thank you. I, the only thing I would respond is I think there needs to be a presidential candidate like yourself or maybe a Ralph Nader who would run for president on an environmental issue because today I think it's strangely silent on the issue of environment. Thank you. I got my hands full. <laughs> uh, we're really running out of time. We'll take one more question from uh, up there. Hi. All right, we'll take two more questions, one here and one there. Hi, my name's Ethel Branch. I'm a joint degree with the law school and the Kennedy School. Um, and I want to commend you all for the tremendous leadership that you have displayed um, in not only your local governments, but your personal lives. Um, one of the things that strikes me about government, and I've really only worked with the federal government, um, is the amount of consumption that the government produces. Um, and I especially see that what, what comes to mind is the fleet at Department of Justice, you know, these big SUVs. <laughs> Um, what are you doing at the local level at, in, in terms of consumption to create that new economy for green products? Are you trying to I realize you have a tight budget, but every new car you buy for the city government could be a hybrid. It doesn't have to be all at once. So what are the incremental things you're well, doing? Well, Honolulu and uh, Albuquerque are the leaders on this one. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 energy efficiency in our vehicles in our city fleet is a major priority with us. Uh, we basically have a goal to convert our buses and, and all of that in two years to use biodiesel uh, or hybrid electric um, to be able to power them. We use 600,000 tons of uh, B20 fuel right now in our citywide trucks and vehicles. So that is a major going priority and we're moving towards that very rapidly uh, because I really believe what you're saying and what you're intimating here that we gotta lead by example. Another initiative I just came up with recently was called green parking. And I felt that before I go to the private sector, I have to do it within city parking facilities. So we did a pilot program where if you drive a hybrid or biodiesel fuel, you'll be able to have preferential parking uh, in a city parking facility. I felt that before I go to the huge shopping centers and private vendors, they're gonna say, well, what are you doing, Mr. Mayor, about it? So let me show it first with the public employees, public facilities that we operate on, and then we're gonna pitch it so that if you use a hybrid vehicle, biodiesel vehicle, you're going to have, uh, you're going to be rewarded for helping us reduce carbon emissions. One of the things we found in Albuquerque, I spent a full year talking to senior administrators about how can we get an alternative fuel fleet and listening to them tell me why it couldn't be done or what all the problems were. And I finally re realized, hey, I'm a strong former mayor, uh, our government, so just do it, executive order. Uh, within a week and a half, those same folks are coming back to me going, well, here's a way we can do it, and here's a way we can do it. Uh, and, and it really uh, sparked a creative process. We have 43% of our fleet now is alternative, uh, and they're not allowed to buy uh, new unless it's alternative, so we'll grandfather those in as they, as they die out. And of course, at, at all, all of our parking meters, it's free if you're a hybrid or, or meet the energy uh, efficiency standards. Uh, I'll give you one, one example. Will Wynn, who's the mayor of Austin, Texas, has started something uh, called the Plug-in Hybrid uh, Alliance. So many of our cities have signed on to that, and we've created a market for plug-in hybrids. So we're now converting, I think, 13 of our Priuses to plug-in hybrids, which means that they have an extra battery pack, and the first 40 miles, they don't use any uh, fossil fuel. And you just plug them in overnight to recharge that battery pack. So we've created a market in that case where, where one didn't exist before. And the other thing, you need strong leadership again that's why all of you in this country is critically important in this election, no matter who you vote for. This issue has to be on the front burner. 
when you hear a debate, when you hear the presidential candidates of both parties start talking about climate change, energy efficiency, then we know we're getting it because they don't get it. You see the mayors are doing it in their own fleets. The federal government, strong leadership, has to make that a priority so they can do it. The last thing I want to say is, look, this is not an issue like when I leave office, we leave office. Like, okay, that was that issue. Now, what's the next issue? This is the issue. This issue's not going anywhere. We're beginning it. This, 100 years from now, what we do today and what all of us do today, 100 years from now, if we're successful, the future generations will say it started here. We're nowhere near where we need to be. So for anybody that thinks the mayor says, well, that's not an issue, I don't got time for that. I'm fighting gangs. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get my school system. Let me tell you something. This is an issue that's going to be here, and you might as well get involved in it while you get involved with all the other issues. All right, well, the last question. I'm afraid we're really out of time. We're over. Uh, Thank you. I'll, I'll make this very quick. Very brief. Uh, I'm Ralph Becker. I'm newly oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm sorry. If I hadn't answered that question, that young lady right there before you leave, let, I should have shut up because you would have had time for a question if I had time. shut up. All right. So um, we can just do those two because okay. I shouldn't even, I shouldn't All even, right. I shouldn't even, I shouldn't have talked. All right. She has been waiting too. All right. Uh, quickly, quickly. Thank you. I, I'm Ralph Becker. I'm the newly elected mayor in Salt Lake City and I commend uh, all of you for your work in showing leadership on this issue, and my predecessor, uh, he's still in office, uh, Mayor Rocky Anderson, I know you know well. Um, you've commented on how the sources for, for greenhouse gases are in transportation and buildings about equal, and, uh, and I know we've been showing uh, leadership as you have in our city in terms of within our city with buildings. The big step is going to be in the private sector, and you've talked about some of the things that are being done to show, uh, to be able to educate the private sector and, and set examples. I'm wondering if you could give me some specifics of, of what you're doing or what you're aware of with other cities that are doing uh, to move the private sector along more quickly. Well, uh, when we put the Seattle plan together, um, we formed a Green Ribbon Commission, I called it, and we had uh, business leaders. We had the outgoing president of Starbucks, which is a major employer, uh, uh, with their headquarters in our city. We had uh, the uh, CEO uh, and board chair of REI, Recreational Equipment, which relies on snow for people to go hike and they buy all their equipment. Um, we had the uh, uh, general manager of the largest cement plant, Lafarge Cement. Cement is a huge emitter. So, uh, so we tried to engage the business community right from the beginning. And um, as I, I mentioned a little while ago, our private market now is demanding that developers build green. We also have put incentives in our building code so that if you want, we, we, we're, like many western cities, we uh, hate sprawl and we despise density in Seattle. And so we had a long conversation about how we could really do both and talked about how we create a vibrant, dynamic city and use density as one of the tools. So we're greatly increasing the density, the density in our city which increases the opportunity for profit for a developer, but the very first thing they need to give back to the public is they need to make their building a lead silver or better. So we're providing incentives, uh, we're engaging them from the very beginning, and then we're trying to convince them there are new markets to be opened up, for instance, it is uh, the capital of green building in the country. Okay, last question, very quickly. Thank you, Monika Kopacz, I'm a PhD student in climate studies, so uh, last question from a scientist. Uh, just a brief question. To what extent is hot air a problem when uh, in cities signing up for these initiatives? Is it basically a parallel to what Russia had uh, with signing the Kyoto, or will there actually be um, some significant reduction in emissions? How, how much of a problem is hot, hot air? Hot air. Uh, just people talking? Uh, well, oh, no, no, hot air being uh, the fact that uh, since the cities are decreasing a lot of times, there's um, it, it's very possible, like Russia is said, oh, definitely we can decrease our emissions from 1990 because we lost all this industry and now obviously we are emitting much less. So to what extent, given the cities are decreasing, to what extent is that a problem? Or are growing cities so, uh, signing up as well? The, um, the, the biggest challenge that we face, I think, is inertia. The, the, lack, the lack of action that we've had at the federal level 
the feeling that as individuals, you really can't make a difference on a global problem. Uh, first, people went from denying it existed to then saying, well, it's too big for us to deal with. So changing attitudes is, I think, the biggest problem. The technologies will be created, I believe. Uh, the strategies will be developed. Uh, and there'll be a continuing role for cities in this, even when our federal government um, uh, takes action and, and hopefully becomes a leader in this area. For the first time in human history, more people live in cities than do not. And we are the engines of our nation's economy, so we burn up 75% of the energy that is uh, expended on this planet, and that's what causes greenhouse gas pollution. So it's going to be creating cities that are, that are dynamic, and uh, great places to live and work that is going to solve this problem. That's why we tackle the issue of density in our city, is we've got to have people wanting to live near where they work, so we're not building freeways. We're not even building multi-billion dollar transit systems. People can walk to work. And so th that kind of change in behavior is what's going to be necessary, but there's going to be a lot of resistance for a lot of different reasons along the road. We really must stop, stop. Thank you so much to all of our mayors. Thank you. Uh, before, before you leave, uh, this is a very busy place, and we are going to get off the stage at 8 p.m. tonight. A reminder that the IOP will be showing the Republican presidential CNN YouTube debate on the forum big screen. So. 25 minutes to go before that starts. <laughs>